You'll know if you're really owning it because your life will be transformed immediately in the wake of that. I think all those first four principles are just statement of truth. They're not telling us what to do. They're just simply stating a truth. The fifth principle, that's the action principle. And if you don't take action on what you know, then what you know has no value. It can have no effect, no consequence in your life unless you're applying it. Like the morning pages with the artist way, or practicing the four agreements, or practicing what we learn in A Course in Miracles, or the unity principles, the metaphysical investigation, to discern meaning from all of these places of wisdom so that we can provide meaning in our life. That was beautiful inspiration. One more hand for them. Carl Logue, Jennifer Fireisel, company on piano. It's gorgeous. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Is it cold outside? Is it cold? Last year, about this time, it was cold as well. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. The title of today's talk is Faith and the Resilience of Spirit. And basically what we're going to be talking about is, you know, a little bit about the power of faith. My partner, Faith, is with me here this morning, so I have, have that in the title also, so she'll feel welcome. <laughs> faith and the Resilience of Spirit. And I, as I was preparing for this, I did two things. One, I looked at a two-part video that I'd done three years ago here. I'm talking about spiritual resilience over a two-part series. And among the things that was discussed in that two-part series was our very own Bob Withrow's presentation of the five principles that was out on YouTube from a service that he did here. And at the time, that video had just under 4,000 views on it. And I encouraged everybody in the service and they're like, go over there and check out Bob's video. Let's get him over $4,000. Maybe they'll monetize the thing, right? <laughs> and so as I was preparing for today's talk, I went back and pulled up uh, Bob's video. It's now got over 30,000 views. So Bob Withrow, <laughs> who I affectionately call Batman, that's an awesome, that's an awesome thing, 30,000 views on that presentation of the five principles. And I say that to say this, Bob is way more succinct and concise talking about the five principles than I am. I go on way longer than Bob does, but he gets to the essence of it. And so I want to try and set the intention here because I want to cover a lot of ground here. And some of that is going to be framed around the five principles. We're also going to talk about the power of faith. We're going to talk about A Course in Miracles. We're going to talk about the artist's way. We're going to talk about the four agreements or the five agreements if you've done the sequel. And we'll talk about the five principles of unity in the midst of that. That's a lot. That's a lot, right? And we don't have time to go deep on it, but I want to make the, I want to make the, the point that a year ago was uh, the last time I spoke here. And it was the third Sunday of the year. And I had done the Whitestone service also that month. And I revealed at the time that my Whitestone word for the year was restoration. It was restoration. And uh, I had asked everybody else to not to conceal their word, not to tell anybody about it. So I kind of went against my own advice when I revealed that the word was restoration. The following week, the ice storm came in. And we all went through that experience. And then... As the ice storm let up and everybody got about the business of recovery, I was over here on the grounds helping to clean the property up around here. And then at a certain point in time, I had to go back to my house. I was meeting somebody who was going to help me move some things around on my property. And as I was doing that, I received a phone call from my brother Ray, who lives out in the uh, Lakeway area. And he told me that our brother Lloyd, who lived out in Dripping Springs, had passed away that morning. And so, wow, that was, you know, didn't have that on my, you know, card that day. Was, didn't have a slot for that. I'd incurred a lot of loss in the preceding years, but most of those were kind of 
expected, as much as expected can be. Someone had a degenerative disease, and you know, we had time to reconcile with that. But my stepbrother Lloyd was the first one that had passed away unexpectedly in quite a while. And then over the course of about the next four weeks, two other friends unexpectedly passed away. And so one of the things I began to realize is that my original intention about restoration last year was about helping to restore the community here. We were going through our transition here. And as it started playing out, as the year started playing out, I was withdrawing from my participation in that because all of a sudden I realized that I had all this accumulated grief from people that I had lost in the previous years by just being busy, just being busy. And so my stepbrother's passing was kind of a, wow, exactly when are you going to like pause and like take a look at all this accumulated grief? Have I been dealing with it? Am I running from it? Am I just keeping busy? What's really true for me? And so I had to kind of slow my roll. And I started backing away and saying no. Tammy was very proud of me that I'd learned to say no when you know, she even applauded me, literally applauded me one day when I said no to a service request to regain that center. And I began to realize as the year was going on that the restoration wasn't really what I originally believed it was. It was me restoring myself. And I was turning 65 at the end of May, and so I was having these conversations. It's like life before 65, life after 65. Like, what do you, you know, what you, what is life after 65? What are you going to reimagine? What's left undone? One day, I asked myself, if I died today, what would be undone? You know, that I had to come back in another lifetime and do. And, and the thing that came to me was my personal writing, like just fully and wholly committing to making my living with my writing. I've done it for a long time, but always as an ancillary thing and making room for my personal creative expression. To be able to move through the experience that I was moving through, getting knocked about, and find a new vision. Uh, Mills Spangberg was mentioned a little earlier, and I have a Mills story where one night we were at a at a meeting, dinner kind of thing, and all talking, and Mills is the first one. First time I'd ever heard the, the term, without vision, the people perish. And it was from the Old Testament and so forth, and I was like, wow. That really, that we have to have a vision that we're moving towards, that's pulling us forward, that's giving us incentive and motivation to express. And if we don't have a vision pulling us forward that's in a positive direction, it's going to be you know, not going to be very resilient. So we have to have that vision. And so for me, it clarified around writing. And I had a book. Some of y'all know about the book but it's, that I'm working on. And then as soon as I got really, really committed writing, and I was writing for about 30 days, all of a sudden, an opportunity came out of left field to get paid to write, right? And it was editing a book. And they needed it by the end of the year. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm your guy. And I was very excited. And all of a sudden, that book started taking, the con fulfilling that contract started taking away from my time to personally write the novel that I was working on. But I was getting paid to write. I was getting paid to write. And then about midsummer, I'm on the way. It's a Sunday morning. I'm getting ready to go to Unity of Temple to speak. I'm already dressed and literally going in. We discover a leak in the garage. It was leaking from the second story into the garage, and it had ruined some stuff, and I'm on the way out the door. And Faith is a go-getter. Like, as I was gone, they pulled the garage apart and got everything out of the way, and when I got back, everything was pretty much in disarray, and all the wet boxes were right there. And I had to start sorting through that. And so here was this crisis, right? Now we got, what am I doing Monday? We got to get a plumber out here. We got to figure out all, what all this is. And as it turned out, it wasn't very serious, like in terms of what it took to get it repaired. But in the process, all of the stuff that had been accumulating in the garage that was accumulated energy that was bogging down our lives that we intended to do something about, we were forced to do something about. And what did we have to do? We had to restore order back to the space. 
there's that theme of restoration coming up, that the universe came in and we were able to respond and restore order. And so now the, the space is beginning to feel like I've wanted it to feel since we moved in there eight years ago and I've never been able to get to. But it was in that reorganization and doing the work necessary to go through the crisis that created the opportunity. That's what I'm talking about, the resilience of spirit, is that if we have a vision about how we're going to respond, if we have tools in our tool belt that we use whenever life attempts to knock us off balance, we have something to calibrate back to. And we perceive that with the power of our faith, that we perceive that possibility, like I can perceive the possibility of how this garage as a working area should look now that I have the opportunity to restore it. And then realize that, and that energizes your life because you're moving in the direction of your vision. The only time we're frustrated is when we're not moving in the direction of our vision. Something is impeding our progress. And so to be resilient, what is that? You know, there's words that, that come up about resilient, but basically it's that ability to respond, to bounce back. There's a elasticity is implied in that in a scientific way. Buoyancy, able to respond. These are all high, high value words, high energy words, and that we should use in our process to describe our experience. Do you feel buoyant? Do you feel resilient? These are great words. These are great words to strive for because we have all the tools, right? We've got the five principles. And I'll make a case, maybe not here today because it might take too long, but I can make a case that the five principles are as important a presentation of practical principles to live your life by as the four agreements or the artist's way or A Course in Miracles, you know, or any number of other presentations that the unity principles have that much value. A Course in Miracles says the value of anything, the value of anything is in its usefulness as a learning device. Does it facilitate learning? If it facilitates learning and it facilitates growth, then it has value. So what has value? Like for me, the artist way had tons of value. Learning the morning pages, learning to recover my creative spirit, that was very valuable. That helped with the resilience of spirit. You know, the four agreements certainly was a big piece in my life, of course, in miracles, many other modalities. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh's writing, all these kinds of things gave me something to recalibrate to when life was bouncing me around or external circumstances appeared dark. We have to be able to respond. We have to have a vision that's pulling us forward and we're able to see that, perceive that with the power of our faith, right? And then we employ the principles. So there's only one power, one presence active in the universe and in my life. We call that power and presence God. We say that power and presence is good. We don't say there's an alternative. There's only good. And that we are created in the image and likeness of that power and presence. Therefore, we are inherently divine. We are also inherently good. Inherently good, all of us, no matter what our story is. And we're co-creating this experience by the thoughts and the feelings that we allow to dominate in our consciousness. What are we focusing on? What are we attaching to? What are we thinking about ourselves, our friends, our family, our community, the world? What are we thinking about what we've done in the world, what we'd like to do in the world? All those thoughts occupy our space every day. Every day. That's a statement of truth principle. It's not a value judgment about it. It's just a statement of fact that we are having this going on internally. And the only thing that I can be responsible for and ultimately in charge of is what happens right here and in here. That's really all that's in, in my control. And so am I being cognizant of what's going through my consciousness? Am I preparing myself to be resilient when misadventure comes or 
unforeseen circumstances? How am I going to respond? We have to have a game plan before you actually play the game, right? You got to have a game plan. Was it, was it somebody? I think it was Mike Tyson, I think, said something. That they get. Everybody has a game plan until they get smacked in the head first time. <laughs> you know? So do you have a game plan? Do you have something to recalibrate back to? That's got to be part of your thinking. You'll know. You'll know if you're doing all you can to, to prepare yourself for that. And you'll know if you're not. And if you're not, it's not an opportunity to judge yourself. Just what can you do to prepare yourself to be resilient in spirit for whatever comes from the external world? And if you're confused by all the thinking, and sometimes I get confused by all the thinking too, what do we do? We take time in the silence. We go within. We connect with the indwelling Christ presence that we all are. There's no, there's no barrier, there's no limitation between you and that indwelling teacher. The only thing that we have to do is to get ourselves still, get ourselves quiet, make ourselves transparent, make ourselves vulnerable, sensitive, to listen for what's coming up from that inner knowing place. We have to put everything in the world out here on neutral to spend one of those testimonies there about the experience with Lance over the 20 to 30 minutes and how many gifts and blessings that gentleman received in just that short encounter. A Course in Miracles says every encounter is what, Neil? A holy encounter. That means that every encounter has the opportunity, the circumstances, for miracles to be expressed. The holy instant. Miracles in every single interaction. Every single one. And if we're coming from that place of identifying with our indwelling Christ first, because we spend time in the silence, because we cultivate that awareness of that connection we contemplate and own for ourselves that we are divine beings creating the image and the likeness of god and we own that you really have to own it you'll know if you're really owning it because your life will be transformed immediately in the wake of that and all those four principles Bob and I have a couple different ways of presenting these things. I think all those first four principles are just statement of truth. They're not telling us what to do. They're just simply stating a truth. The fifth principle, that's the action principle. And if you don't take action on what you know, then what you know has no value. It can have no effect, no consequence in your life unless you're applying it like the morning pages with the artist way, or practicing the four agreements, or practicing what we learn in A Course in Miracles, or the unity principles, the metaphysical investigation to discern meaning from all of these places of wisdom so that we can provide meaning in our life. If you're having a meaningless life, it's not a lot of fun. You've got to find a meaning for why we've experienced what we've experienced. It gives you resilience to do so. That pursuit of finding meaning in your life and calibrating back towards the light to the best of your ability, that's what gives life deep meaning. That's what provides resilience of spirit. As we get ready to go into meditation, I just want to invite you as that Everything we need to know is within. It's, not, it's beyond even the questions that we could bring. It's just get still in the silence, and that inner teacher will reveal, will speak. You'll be able to hear, listen, and receive. And so as we prepare for the meditation, they're going to be singing a song that Susan Tingley here wrote. It's called When I Pray. She's going to be uh, directing them, and then I'll be right back with the meditation. Uh, enjoy this beautiful song.
divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I circulate, and I am grateful. 